Today I'm down in Southern California driving the all new and thoroughly redesigned Mercedes-Benz C-Class. For 2022, Mercedes has definitely reclaimed the title of benchmark in the compact luxury segment because this C-Class has more of everything. We have more power, more efficiency, bigger screens on the inside, more gadgets, gizmos, and active safety systems than the C-Class has ever had before. Now this particular model is the top end trim for the C300 and it also has an AMG line option package on it as well. That gives us slightly different treatment on the outside and of course on the inside. We have full LED headlights just as you'd expect in a luxury sedan and I really love what Mercedes does with their grills. If you zoom in really close on this grill you'll notice that we have little tiny Mercedes logos that are the individual elements inside this grill. We of course then have the big huge Mercedes logo there, another Mercedes logo on the hood just in case you're forgetting what you're driving. As we typically see with Mercedes and honestly most luxury car companies, the C-Class definitely has an aura of shrunken S-Class to it when you view this from afar, but up close you'll notice that not all the style lines are pulled directly from the larger sedan. This particular model has a $600 optional 19-inch wheel option on it, staggered tires, 255s in the rear, 225s up front. For this generation, the C-Class has grown notably over the outgoing model. This is now over 187 inches long, and it retains the classic long hood proportion you'd expect from a rear-wheel drive Mercedes. That definitely differentiates this from the A-Class and the CLA, which are front-wheel drive-based vehicles. Now, the stretch partially goes to the hood for pedestrian safety, most likely in other world markets, but it also goes to the back seats. This is now on the extreme long end of the luxury compact segment in America, and right about the same length as the Volvo S60. No Mercedes would be complete without a bit of bling in the tail lamp modules, so of course we find that in the C-Class. These are full LED modules. Really interesting touch here are these sort of scallop shapes that you can really see from the side of this tail lamp module. Those are reflectors for the turn signal. The LED is firing from the top and then being reflected out towards the rear. It is an amber turn signal, not a red turn signal, even though this entire module is tinted red to help give it a more cohesive look around the back. In a move that's becoming a little bit less common with some luxury car companies, we still have twin integrated exhaust tips down at the bottom of the bumper. Some car companies want to give their electric vehicles and their electrified vehicles a more cohesive look with their ICE vehicles, and we don't see that in the Mercedes lineup. We still see some differentiation going down there at the bottom of the bumper. The brake lights have a very similar design, only the scalloped reflectors are for LEDs that are firing from the bottom towards the top. For 2022, Mercedes didn't just give us a new exterior and new interior, we also get a new drivetrain under here. In the C300, it's a 2-liter 4-cylinder turbocharged mild hybrid engine. This is the first time that the Mercedes mild hybrid system has been put onto a 4-cylinder engine. In its own right, this turbo produces 255 horsepower and 295 pound-feet of torque. It's then augmented by a 20-horsepower electric motor that will add an additional 148 pound-feet of torque whenever it's required. That electric motor sits between the turbo engine up front and the 9-speed automatic transmission behind, which has been redesigned for this mild hybrid system and, of course, the C300 application, where the transmission shifts a little bit faster and it weighs a little bit less also. As with other Mercedes hybrids, Mercedes does not give us a total horsepower figure of gasoline engine plus electric motor because it's used in a slightly different way than you might expect in a full hybrid. Over the few hours that I've been inside this model, front seat comfort appears pretty comparable with the outgoing model, which definitely means very good for the segment. We have a four-way adjustable lumbar support in this model, Mercedes seat kinetics but not seat massage, an extending thigh cushion, and four-way adjustable headrest. And as we see in many Mercedes models, the front passenger seat has the exact same range of motion as the driver's seat, including the memory positions on the door. Most of the exterior stretch in this C-Class seems to have gone to the hood for improved pedestrian safety and just that longer hood profile, but a little bit does rain down to the back seats. With this front seat adjusted for me at six feet tall, I have about five inches of legroom left. That's an improvement of approximately one inch versus the outgoing model. Now this is still a rear wheel drive vehicle, so we have a pretty prominent driveline hump right there, but definitely enough room if I move over to the middle seat for people that aren't quite as tall as I am, I definitely can't put my head back there to that headrest. From this position, you'll probably notice the dual pane panoramic moonroof that is an option on this vehicle. And then if I scoot all the way over to the right side where this front seat is all the way back in its tracks, I now have about two inches of legroom left. Definitely still an improvement over the outgoing model. 
As far as headroom goes for the outboard seating positions, as long as my head is not back there on the headrest, I have about half an inch of headroom left. But if I put my head right against the headrest, then my head is touching the ceiling. You will notice that there is more real world headroom in here than we find in many of the compact luxury entries in the US because more coupe like profiles and slammed roof lines are becoming awfully common. A feature that we generally only find in European sedans for some reason is a 40-20-40 folding seat back. This really improves practicality over a pure 60-40 design or even a ski pass-through because it means you can fold this entire center section down and still seat four people in here. This feature allows you to more easily put longer items from the cargo area into the cabin like skis, snowboards, or if you're a regular shopper at Ikea, those longer items will easily fit in here while you still have four people in the seats. With most of the length increase going to the hood, some of it going to the rear seat passengers, there wasn't any left to increase the size of the cargo area, but that's not a problem for the C-Class because at 17.9 cubic feet, this is already a really big trunk. It's actually bigger than many of the mid-size luxury sedans that you might want to see this as a new value alternative to. For those longer road trips, you will find additional storage space under the load floor. This is what the Mercedes cargo divider solution looks like right there. But as we see in most European luxury vehicles these days, no spare tire. As with the exterior, the interior of the new C-Class has a style that is very similar to the S-Class, but it's not simply a scale model version of the S-Class. Just in front of the moonroof, we have the controls for that moonroof, some other controls for the dome lights, things like that. And you can see all the detail going on with the ambient lighting. There's a lot of texture going on in this section, and then the lighting strip is really well hidden behind that seemingly floating section. We have a large moonroof, but not a panoramic design, just over the driver and front passenger's heads. The driver and front passenger get height adjustable shoulder belts and four-way adjustable headrests. Moving down to the seat, you can see that the design is different than the S-Class, but there are some similarities as well because we have the controls over here on the driver and front passenger door, three position memory for both seating positions, and these are Mercedes' new touch controls. Going over to the driver's side so you can see how this operates, if I press on this back portion, the seat back moves, but you notice that the module itself does not move around. Same thing goes for scooting the seat bottom cushion forward and backward and the seat extension as well. The dashboard styling is a merge of themes from various different Mercedes products and all done extremely well. You can see that the infotainment system in this tablet orientation is definitely borrowed out of the S-Class, as is the large LCD instrument cluster. But these are scaled down versions of what we see in the Mercedes. Moving back over here to the passenger side for just a moment, you can see lots of real wood trim going on. And it's a little bit difficult to see on camera, but there's actually a texture to the wood trim that really helps dress things up. Stitched upper section of the dashboard, imitation metal trim insert right there. More trim going on lower, another ambient light strip there. We find a pretty large slot style glove compartment here. It's a bit difficult to tell on camera, but that bottom slot is pretty deep. And then the upper slot has an area where you could put the instruction manual. Mercedes has long been a master of ambient lighting, so we even find it on the inside of these air vents. You can see it best over there on the passenger side air vent from this angle. You can see we have that color changing ambient light element right inside. Then there's a lot of detail going on for these air vents as well. Much like we see in other Mercedes models, you open and close the air vent by rotating this center section around. In the middle of everything, we find the latest Mercedes-Benz infotainment software. And as you can see, it supports Apple smartphone integration in this portrait style layout where we have an almost square display. That definitely makes this much more useful than a wide variety of infotainment systems that use this same sort of screen orientation, but don't support smartphone integration in this manner. Moving to the home screen, you can see that Mercedes has laid out the most common functions like navigation, CarPlay integration, radio there. You can swipe across to media, apps, and then comfort settings. This video would be really long if I went into all of the features and functions that are available within this infotainment system. Suffice it to say, this is one of the most adjustable vehicles out there. You can control a wide variety of different vehicle settings, and there are a ton of additional features that can also be voice commanded with the well-done Mercedes natural voice command. And on the vehicle info page, there are a number of other things you can see here, like accelerator position, braking position, and you can also get horsepower and torque. To the left of the infotainment system, we find the engine start stop button and a button to disable the auto start stop system. But honestly, you're probably not going to need to do that because the air conditioning system is powered by the battery pack. Down here, we have a drive mode selector. That's what dynamic means. So you can cycle through the various drive modes. They're displayed on the infotainment system right up there. We also have a button for the parking cameras and the autonomous parking system. This button takes you direct to certain vehicle settings. That way it's a little bit easier to adjust them. This is the fingerprint reader. Setting up a fingerprint is pretty easy and honestly that's a really cool feature. We then have the power and volume controls for the infotainment system. Then we have a lot of storage right here in the center console. If I slide that forward, you can see we have two very large cup holders there. They're definitely well sized. And if I 
pull that out, you can actually remove the cup holders from that center console, and that gives you easier access to the Qi wireless charging mat. There's also a USB input there, and then we have a very large storage area that's easily usable. Thanks to some nifty light pipes on the end of the cup holders, both cup holders feature ambient lighting when docked in, and then we have these little buttons here to pop out those little drink holders. Between the front seats, we find a padded armrest. It opens in a bifold fashion, and as you can see, there's a reasonable amount of storage space in there. There's a ton of stuff stuffed in there right now. We have two USB-C connections. Those can be used for smartphone integration, or you can use Apple CarPlay wirelessly. The large LCD cluster is one of the most configurable in the industry. You can see that there are a bunch of different views you can choose from. That's the sporty view there. There is a more classic view. There's that understated view that you saw first. There's also a moving map view. So you can see we have the map being pulled right out of the infotainment system in the center console. We then have a driver assistance view where it's going to show you the status of the active driving systems. And as you'd expect, there are a ton of different ways to configure the heads up display as well. Although somewhat sadly, this full color heads up display is not quite as configurable as the one that we find in the S class. I guess you could say that this steering wheel is a six spoke model. We have a split bottom spoke and then split side spokes as well. There are paddles on the back of the steering wheel for gear shift changes and they're connected to the lower spoke on either side. This has perforated leather sections on each side. You can see it has a flat bottom, pretty aggressive sport grips right there, and then stocks behind for the windshield wipers and the gear shift of course as well. The controls on the steering wheel are a combination of touch button and physical buttons, that way you get some haptic feedback. If we press the home button, for instance, this entire module clicks in just as it does with the back button, and then the system knows which option you've selected by which one you have actually touched. You can then scroll around using that option right there, it's actually a little scroll wheel. We find something very similar over on this side. As with other versions of Mercedes software with touch controls, this touch control bank on the right side of the steering wheel controls the infotainment system. The one on the left side of the steering wheel controls the instrument cluster. The controls for the radar adaptive cruise control are quite similar on the left side of the steering wheel, as are the infotainment controls over on the right side. And then to the left of the steering wheel, we find more buttons over here on the driver's side door, but very similar styling there. Again, lots of ambient lighting going on. That's a really good angle to see what it looks like on the side panels there. More rear wood trim, more ambient lighting, the controls for the headlights down there. When you first get the C300 out on the road, you're certainly going to notice the smoothness of the auto start stop system, thanks to that larger electric motor there. And you'll notice the extra torque that that motor yields. Now the important thing to know about this mild hybrid system, which honestly applies to pretty much any pancake motor hybrid system period, is that you don't simply add the horsepower and torque figures from the electric motor to the gasoline engine because their peaks do not happen at the same time. Now logically this system likely creates more than 295 pound-feet of torque at some moment, but Mercedes doesn't exactly give us the totals in that manner because this is a mild hybrid system after all. The battery is relatively small, so even though the motor will add boost basically to the vehicle, it's not going to add it for very long. It does, however, have a noticeable impact on turbo lag, especially when starting out from a stop, and it is going to help smooth out shifts between gears. According to Mercedes, when everything is working together, this should go 0-60 to 60 in about 5.9 seconds, and the all-wheel drive model should be right around that same time. Even though it adds a little bit of weight, it's definitely going to improve traction. Even though this is a reasonably small displacement single turbo engine, it does have that electric motor which really adds a lot of low-end grunt, so you'll notice in the rear-wheel drive model that you do get a little bit of rear wheel spin. As far as 60 to 0 stopping distances go, expect this to be right around 110, 115 feet when properly equipped. When it comes to handling, the new C-Class doesn't turn over a new leaf versus the outgoing model, but to be honest, there was nothing wrong with the foliage on the outgoing model to begin with. If you're interested in the most engaging driving dynamic in this segment, the best communicative steering, etc., you're going to want the Alfa Romeo. But the Alfa Romeo falls apart in other ways. It's definitely more cramped on the inside, it's not as quiet, it's not as refined as the C-Class. It does have a pretty powerful base engine, but it sounds a lot gruffer when you floor it. The Lexus IS also has excellent steering, but not a lot of power from its engine lineup. And even something like the up-level 3.5 liter V6, it's going to struggle to go 0-60 to 60 in the same time as this base engine in the C-Class, and again, this is just where the Mercedes starts. Now speaking of engines and engine refinement, you should know that although this 2-liter turbo is certainly more refined than the one that we find in the Alpha, it is certainly a bit gruffer than some of the 6-cylinder engines that we have seen in the past in the C-Class, even though this is going to be quicker. And that just seems to be the way that most European car companies are going, because we do know that the next generation AMG platforms will likely be using significantly tuned versions of basically this same engine, or the 2-liter engine that we find in other AMG products currently. 
Who knows what the future holds for the C-Class lineup in general. It's always possible that the 3.0-liter inline-six could fit under the hood. That is definitely a glorious engine from Mercedes, but I'm not entirely clear if it's in the cards for the American market C-Class. In terms of ride quality compared to the model that I'm driving right now, which does not have an adaptive suspension system, you will find better ride quality in the Volvo and in the Audi competition, but this is right in line with the majority of the European options. And there are certainly versions of the Audi A4 or the Volvo S60 that are going to be this firm out on the road. It's not uncomfortably firm, this is just certainly tuned towards the sportier side of things. During the time that I've spent in this model, which does have the optional acoustic laminated glass, I've found the cabin to be pretty quiet. I would not be surprised if this ended up one of the quieter options in the compact stand segment. Engine noise is especially well controlled. Until you floor it, you will hear some engine noise and some exhaust noise, but I think it's fairly pleasing. But other than that, when you're hill climbing, etc., you're digging deeper into the throttle but not flooring it, the engine is pretty muted. And even though this particular model has the optional Eagle F1 tires on it, which would generally increase road noise, that's definitely well controlled in this cabin. I don't have any fuel economy estimates just yet. This particular model is EPA rated for 27 mpg, and over a day of mainly highway driving, I've been averaging about 29 mpg, so right about where you'd assume a 2-liter turbo should be. Now to the nitty gritty. If you want to get your hands on the new C300, these are going to be on dealer lots in May of 2022, and they're going to start at $43,550 plus destination. Now, you should be aware that as with other Mercedes models, the C300 has an extensive options list. And if you get carried away with options, you can definitely get this model over $60,000. As equipped right now, without all-wheel drive, there's no 4 -matic badge right back there, this one came in just under $58,000 with the destination charge. And let's talk about the extensive options list here. So this paint color, $750. The AMG black leather on the inside, $1,620. The 19-inch wheels, relative bargain at $600 there. The summer tires, no charge option, but illuminated door sills, $150. The panoramic dual-pane moonroof, $1,000. Sirius XM with only a trial subscription, $350. Acoustic glass to help make the cabin a little bit quieter, $150. Expanded ambient lighting, $250. The wireless charging mat, $200. That is not included. The navigation software, $1,700. $650 for the Burmester 3D audio system. That's actually probably a pretty good deal. The AMG line package with the AMG body styling, etc. That's a pretty healthy option at $3,050. Also a little spendy is the driver assistance package on this model, $1,950. Gets you a ton emergency braking, active blind spot assist, active lane change assist, all those sorts of features, etc. Some of those features are standard on some of the competition, and Mercedes, you're going to have to pay a little extra for them. This one also has the autonomous parking system, 360-degree camera for $950, and destination was $1,050. So keep in mind, if you want the best compact luxury sedan in America, you are going to be paying premium prices for that premium experience because the C300 is just where the C-Class line is going to start. Expect AMG models coming soon, expect more powerful non-AMG models also, and expect them all to be more expensive than this C300. And to be perfectly honest, I'm just fine with that because Mercedes has always been in the past the real leader when it came to luxury and opulence on the inside. And with their latest models, they have definitely reclaimed that crown. The interior is simply more premium, a nicer place to spend your time than the Audi, the BMW, the Volvo, etc. Now, most of those options will cost you less, so if you're interested in value, you're going to find it over there. If you're interested in luxury, you're going to find it here. How exactly that value proposition stacks up with the C300, for that you're going to have to wait until I can get my hands on one of these back at home and run it through my usual battery of comparisons and tests, but again, expect it to be a little bit more expensive than comparable features in most of the competition. But if you're looking for the best compact luxury sedan, right now, get the C300. And in the meantime, be sure and hit that subscribe button down there at the bottom of your screen, find me over at Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all those other social places, and I'll see all of you just as soon as I can.